We talk politics and elections with an expert that's known Donald Trump for years. Her name is Lisa De Pasquale. Welcome to the Mike Broomhead Show. Well, I got a message. I got a song. Can I get a witness? Tell me what's going on. Show the people. You know, we have got a special guest in studio this week, someone that's a political expert that's been around the political scene for years now. We're going to talk about the political divide here in America and kind of get a different picture of what's happening in this election cycle. But first, we start off every show with something we call The Sweep, and it's sponsored by our good friends at Zero Res Carpet and Tile Cleaning. Got to start off with the elections. Donald Trump, he visits Arizona. He goes to Prescott Valley to a rally up there in northern Arizona. And I love that area of the state. I love Northern Arizona. 20,000 people showed up. I don't know how the media is not covering this more. I don't care what you think of Donald Trump. It doesn't matter what your opinion of him is. Prescott Valley is a small town in Northern Arizona and he visited on a weekday. The doors opened at 11 o'clock and middle of the workday for people, 20,000 people showed up at an arena that seats 7,500. The streets were lined like it was a parade. How do people not at least give him credit for the movement that he started? It's only fair. I'm as critical of Donald Trump as anybody else when he deserves it, but you've got to give the man credit for the movement and the following that he has. On the other side, Hillary Clinton. Now, Julian Assange, they come out with this WikiLeaks dump, it was like an Anthony Weiner picture, you know, a lot of excitement, a lot of buildup, not much to see, and there was nothing in it. But Hillary Clinton remaining silent on a lot of issues. She isn't talking about a lot of things right now. Middle of debate prep because on Sunday night is the next presidential debate. There is still a lot going on about her and her um, emails are still out there. And a story about this, here's the deal with Hillary Clinton. We talked about this on the radio show in a Phoenix federal courtroom. There was a man named Mark Turry. He is a gun dealer. He does it for a living. He was arrested and he was tried, was going to be tried for selling guns to the Libyan rebels that were trying to unseat Muammar Gaddafi. This is going back 2010, 2011. And he was arrested for this. He had documentation where he said this was part of a covert operation from the Obama administration. Hillary Clinton was in on it and it was selling guns to the country of Qatar. Then Qatar would take the guns and transfer them to the Libyan rebels because in the middle of the Arab Spring in the Middle East, we were trying to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi through the Libyan rebels. Well, this all fell apart and this guy was left holding the bag. His lawyers made demands for disclosure. They wanted emails and documents to prove their case. And a federal judge agreed and gave them until Wednesday of last week to give over those documents and disclosure. And instead of giving over the documents that would have incriminated Hillary Clinton, made her look bad in an election cycle, they dropped the case against the gun runner. No charges, no conviction. He's agreed to not run guns or be in the gun business for five years. That's it. Now you tell me that they're not doing everything they can at all levels of the federal government to cover things up for Hillary Clinton. We had a vice presidential debate this past week. Mike Pence, Governor Mike Pence, Senator Tim Kaine sat down by most accounts. Mike Pence was the winner. The interruptions were incredible. Um, Tim Kaine interrupted over, what, 72 times, I think they counted, he interrupted Mike Pence. The fact is, he interrupted him when he didn't need to interrupt him. At one point, um, I think it was Mike Pence who said, let me talk to you about 9-11. On 9-11, I was at the Pentagon, and I saw the plumes of smoke rising, and Tim Kaine jumped in. I was in Virginia, and he says, yeah, I know you were. I know you were, Senator. It, it, he really took a lot of heat for it. Tim Kaine trying to put some spin on it. But in the end, Mike Pence did a phenomenal job. Now, the moderator, Elaine Quijano, she is from CBS Digital or CBS Streaming. She took a lot of heat. And she took a lot of heat, I think, justifiably for not being able to control that debate. But to her defense, that would have been a tough one to defend anyway or to control. Here locally in Arizona, Steve Banta is the man's name. He's the former CEO of Valley Metro. He lost his job. He resigned and was forced out because there was about $300,000 in overcharges or in wrongful charges that he got reimbursed for. So what happened was he would file for reimbursement for trips and for dinners and for booze and for all these other things to the tune of $300,000. 
Well, when he lost his job, Valley Metro gave him $180,000 in severance. The city of Phoenix, three of the council members said, we don't want that. We want that money to come out of Valley Metro's budget. Phoenix taxpayers shouldn't pay it. So it went to a full vote of the city council and guess what? The Phoenix City Council denied it and the people of Phoenix paid that $64,000. And then they had the gall to say that the Phoenix taxpayers actually saved money. It's absolutely ridiculous. And another thing that's wrong with American government, the guys under investigation for fraud and embezzlement. There you have it. Now what we've got coming up in just a few moments is an interview with Lisa De Pasquale. She was the former director of CPAC. She's a contributor to thefederalist.com. She used to write for Breitbart. It's a great interview. Before we get to it, my good friends at Zero Res Carpet and Tile Cleaning. Zero Res uses something called empowered water. It's a patented formula. They change the alkaline level of the water so there's no soap, no chemical residue. It's better for the fabric in your carpet or anybody that walks on your carpet. Your carpets actually dry faster and they stay cleaner longer. The holidays are right around the corner. Get a hold of Zero Res. Get on their schedule. Get those carpet cleaned before the holidays and they fill up. They're the best in the business. Contact Zero Res. Get more of Mike Broomhead on Facebook, Twitter, and of course weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on News Talk 550 KFYI. You know, to get a different perspective on the election, we are with Lisa De Pasquale, who is a contributor to thefederalist.com and former director of CPAC. Yes. And you're, you introduced Donald Trump before Donald Trump was really a political figure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was back in, in 2011. He was a surprise guest. Um, and it sort of got through the crowd when the plane landed, you know, at um, DCA or wherever it landed in DC. So it got around that he was probably going to make a surprise appearance at CPAC. And the funny thing is, is that we had another speaker who wanted to speak, but we really didn't have time for him. So instead, he introduced me. Um, and that person was Ted Cruz. So I was sort of in a, a Cruz Trump sandwich for about five minutes. So, <laughs> so Ted Cruz didn't get to speak because Donald Trump was. Not because of Trump, but because no one knew who Ted Cruz was. It's almost like a metaphor for what happened in the election. <laughs> yeah. So th this may be a grudge match that goes back to <laughs> Yeah, the 2011. Yeah, and I started it all. What was he like? What was Donald Trump like back then? Um, he was really personable. I mean, he because then he was really just um, like a pop culture figure. I mean, he had cameras with him all the time. Um, I don't know if it was for documentary purposes or, or just that's how he lived his life. Um, but he was he had a, a bunch of people with him. Uh, but he was really personable. Like when he was in his limo about to leave, um, he got out and he's like, "Wait, where's the girl who introduced me? I want to get a photo with her." Wow. That was nice. Yeah, I thought so. So when you watch what's going on now, what's with this political divide? Fox News, you got Hannity and Megyn Kelly fighting with each other. You have people in the same network, sometimes even in the same political party, that are not just disagreeing, but almost not speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. How did we get there? Well, I think it's been really hard because for the last couple of elections, we've listened to a small group of people that said, you know, this is the only person who is electable. And for a very long time, this group of people are the ones that had sort of the political power and the political clout. And now, with this election in particular, um, whether you know they started with Bush and then went to Rubio and then just worked their way down the line until eventually it was just never Trump, um, and they're sort of being proven wrong by all of the, the voters um, and then also people in with other media outlets like Breitbart. And you know I think that it's getting really dirty and ugly because people are realizing that maybe their standing in the conservative movement isn't what they thought it was. Is there a knock or is there a fair criticism of Sean Hannity being fully in the tank and not being any kind of a journalist with um, Donald Trump or Breitbart kind of being all in for Donald Trump and not being a, a news source anymore but being propagandist? Is mm -hmm. there any validity to those criticisms? Well, I mean, I think it would be different if Sean Hannity presented himself as a journalist. I mean, I think he's already said that he's a conservative and right. he comes at it from a conservative point of view. Um, same for Breitbart. Um, a lot of people have said that um, you know, Andrew wouldn't have been for Trump. Um, I actually disagree with that. I think that, you know, eventually he would have been for the nominee. Um, up until a couple months ago, uh, I wrote full time for Breitbart. Uh, but I think that it, it is getting more difficult in that, on one hand, they've been really successful in, in, in doing the t kind of Trump coverage that they've been doing. They've had a, a tremendous amount of access, both Sean and and Breitbart, so you don't necessarily want to get that away, particularly when the person could be president. 
So the people as, as hate Donald Trump is the mantra, mm -hmm. except he was just here in Arizona this week. 20,000 people in northern Arizona in a small town. They had to make the trip an hour to an hour and a half away from downtown Phoenix. 20,000 people showed up for a 7,500 seat arena. They lined the streets like a parade route. Which is the real indicator of how the public feels about Trump from what you're seeing mm -hmm. and the people you know? Well, I mean, it's, it's funny because in 2008, it was that crowds don't matter, right? Um, or no, that crowds did matter. That ever, you know, the fact that Obama could bring out all of these people um, was a big indicator. And I think now we're seeing from both the left and the never Trumpers, the, the fact that those two disagree is, I think, the problem that a lot of conservative the, the Trump supporters have is that I, th you know, we've held our nose and voted for the last eight years and and even prior to that. You know, why can't you do? do this. And I think that um, among the never Trumpers, they're just going to go down swinging. And, and they're ready to, to have that on them. Because I think probably at the end of the day, they do think Hillary might win. Um, and I think it benefits them to some extent because um, they've always been, you know, antagonizers of, of the people in power. So, you know, they're going to continue to be able to raise money, sell subscriptions, you know, whatever they have to do. Do you believe, uh, which, is, which is a bigger indicator to you, the small crowds at Hillary Clinton rallies? I mean, could it be they've just made up their mind? There's no need to go. They've figured it out. They're voting for her. Mm -hmm. Or the big crowds for Trump? Is, it, is either one an indicator of what you think Election Day is going to be like, or is it just the way it is because he's such a pop icon? Well, I think with a Trump rally, regardless of what side you're on, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen at a Trump rally. I mean, at a Hillary rally, it's going to be less exciting. I mean, she's going to have her talking points. You know, she's not going to have any off-the-cuff moments. Um, she might fall down, but she's not going to, you know, have any off-the-cuff moments. And there's definitely less excitement with Hillary, mostly because she's not a new candidate. I mean, she's been around for 30 years. And as, as far as how that turns out into votes, I don't think that small crowds are much, much of an indicator for Hillary just because they have so many institutions behind them, you know, like colleges and universities, right. the media, and, you know, the well, system. Well, I want to talk about that. I want to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about fairness in the media and bias, but also hypocrisy. I have a hypocrisy question for you. We'll get to that here in just a few moments. Don't go away. Uh, we're back. We're talking elections, and we have with us a, really an expert in this area because she lives politically, Breitbart, CPAC, TheFederalist.com. It's Lisa De Pasquale, and I, I said I wanted to ask you a hypocrisy question. So let me ask you this. When you look at what's gone on, is there hypocrisy from the Republican Party? I was in Tampa when they nominated Mitt Romney, and there was an uprising of the Ron Paul supporters because of the rule changes, mm -hmm. and the leadership of the Republican Party sat down with the Ron Paul supporters and said... Ron Paul's got no chance. We have to show unity. So get behind the nominee. Let's go win this race. Mm -hmm. And to the, to the credit of most of the Ron Paul supporters, they did just that. Well, now, the tables will turn this time around. And the old guard in the Republican Party doesn't, doesn't have the power anymore. Now it's the outsider. Mm -hmm. And the very same people that said you have to step in line with the nominee, a lot of them aren't. Yeah. Does that show hypocrisy to the Republican voters? I mean, definitely. I mean, you remember at the beginning of, of the primary season, they wanted all of the candidates to sign the pledge, saying that they would re support the Republican nominee. And everyone said, oh, there's no way Trump will do it because he's not a real Republican or a real candidate. And, you know, he signed it. And then it was everyone else that was a little bit slower to support the nominee. Um, and at CPAC, we had a similar um, ordeal because I think for two or three years straight, Ron Paul won the straw poll. And a lot of people, you know, would reach out to me, uh, you know, people that have been attending CPAC for 20 years, way before my time, um, would say, you have to do something about the straw poll. You know, he, you can't have this libertarian um, candidate come in and have all the libertarian students come in and vote for him. Um, but for me, the positivity was always that he expanded um, CPAC, which I think Trump in some ways expands the party, or at least expands the movement or expands the voter base. Um, and that was what was, you know, similar with, with Ron Paul. Um, you know, he would bring 2,000 students to CPAC every year, which was great for the media to see so many young faces. And I think that there's more of a concentration on wanting to control the party or control the results of the straw poll uh, than it actually reflect uh, the views and, and the anger that's out there. Is it power? Because you would think if I'm Ryan's Priebus and I'm a wrestler of Republican leadership and I see that there's a candidate, whether I agree with them or not, 
that has gotten more votes in a primary than any other Republican ever, mm -hmm. I would at least want to know why there's a disconnect between leadership and the Republican voters, because mm -hmm. there was definitely a disconnect there. They disagreed with them completely, and it's almost as if they turned a blind eye to that, at least for a while, because mm -hmm. he's a different guy now than he was three months ago. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not just, I guess, what you would call Republican leaders. It's also the people that make money at this, and that's the consultants. And so, you know, now for, you know, 20 months or however long it's been, um, these consultants keep getting proven wrong, which I would assume is not going to be good for business. And, you know, you could say the same, I think, about some Republican leaders, some pollsters, some people in the media. I mean, at some point, uh, people are going to say, why should I be listening to you? you? You've been wrong. Yeah, I was at, a, at an event with, I don't want to say the guy's name, but a very famous political pundit who said Mitt Romney is going to win this election and this is why and all the reasons why. And we looked, every single reason he gave, he was wrong. Yeah. And so you wonder, okay, are we going to listen to this person ever again? So here's the question. I asked this question on the radio show this morning. Is there a difference between Sean Hannity and how he handles the interviews with Donald Trump and when Steve Harvey gives Hillary Clinton all the questions before the interview and she pretends it's the first time she's ever heard them, is there a difference in that bias there? Should people look at that differently? Um, I don't, I, I think there is a difference because I don't think people assume that Hannity is, he's not going to be hard hitting against Trump and that he doesn't put it out there that like I'm going to ask Trump the tough questions where, you know, obviously Steve Harvey, um, you know, it's not a hard hitting political news. Uh, show, but this is also the world that we live in where you have to do the pulp culture stuff. I mean, Trump has done Jimmy Fallon and has done the other late night shows, uh, which I think has been a benefit for Republicans because we don't always have a candidate who's comfortable in that setting. As far as Steve Harvey giving me the questions, I think that's probably the, the biggest difference is that you at the very least expect, even if it's going to be a friendly audience, you know, they're not going to be able to prepare. I mean, and then to act surprised and, you know, this right. has sort of been the thing that people have been most critical about Hillary is not knowing what is actually real. And so when these types of stories come out, it just sort of hammers home the fact that we don't know who this person is. She's not, you know, a real, genuine person. What does each of these two need to do to win in November? <laughs> if you were advising either one or both, what would you say to each one? Well, I mean, what has gotten Trump to where he is is Turn talking about rack. issues that people Libya. care about, whether it's jobs Syria. or the border or immigration. I think he has to keep doing that, and, and it's hard because in a debate, you know, Hillary will say five things that you disagree with, and one of them might be his business, and then he wants to take the next two minutes to just defend his business. And maybe if I were in, had a business that I had put 30 years into, maybe I'd want to hammer that right. too. But I think he's got to get past it and just talk about the issues. Um, for Hillary, I think that she almost just sort of has to wait it out. Um, and as much criticism people have of, you know, her not doing events or not doing media, I mean, that really is what helps her the most. The more people see of her, the less they want to see of her. Well, I appreciate you coming in the studio. I'm glad when you're in Arizona that you come and hang out with us. I know you're, you know, a big shot on Fox News all the time, <laughs> and, and the things that you write are very entertaining. So we're happy that you came in, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. We'll be back. Welcome back. This is one of my favorite parts of the show. We call it From Arizona for America. It's our way to congratulate and thank the fine Arizona men and women who have recently graduated from boot camp and are now serving in our country's military. So please join me this week in honoring Airman First Class Nicholas Hutchinson from Prescott High School in Prescott. Airman First Class Devin Apianis from Mesa High School in Mesa and Reserve Airman First Class Jacob Johnson from Higley High School in Gilbert. Now for a list of more of our friends and neighbors that are from Arizona for America, you can go to the Mike Broomhead page at aztv.com. We'll be back in a moment with Broomhead's best and hashtag this, don't go away. But well, it's time for my favorite part of the show, we call it Broomhead's Best. Let me tell you how highly I think of Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is a Florida Gator. There's not a team in sports I hate more. I'm a Miami Hurricane. And on the week when we are playing the Florida State Seminoles, I'm saying something nice about a Florida Gator. And if any of my family finds out about this, they're probably going to disown me. But he is playing in the Arizona Fall League for the Scottsdale Scorpions, a minor league baseball contract. There is no harder thing to do in sports than hit a baseball. Tim Tebow is a great human being. He hit a home run on his first pitch in the game. This is one heck of an athlete and congratulations to Tim Tebow. Now it's something we call hashtag this. 
It's what's burning up the internet. It's called hashtag this, hashtag clown lives matter. Tucson, Arizona, October 15th, the clowns of Arizona, every legislator in the state will be there, I'm sure. The clowns in Arizona are marching because of all of the bad publicity clowns are getting. We'll be back here to close out the show. Don't go away. Before we close, another horrible report from the Phoenix VA. Six month waiting time, 200 plus veterans die waiting for care. One specifically could have been saved if he had gotten care in time. Now a new VA director that has done a horrible job every place she's been before. When are the voters of this country finally gonna say enough is enough and demand solutions from the elected officials? It's in your hands like it is mine. I'm not gonna stop and you shouldn't either. We owe it to the veterans of this country. Make sure you do that. We're out of time. Have a great week, everyone. God bless. Get more of Mike Broomhead on Facebook, Twitter, and, of course, weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on News Talk 550 KFYI.